Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying a different setup today where I'm actually sitting down, but I'll still have to stand up to use the whiteboard. I hope that won't be too distracting. We'll see what happens. Um, also, I had um, some people have remarked that the uh, resolution that you're getting there is not good enough to read some things I write on the whiteboard. I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh, I saw it in the recording too. So, uh, but I don't see it on my screen here. So uh, I do see like there's sometimes the sound is out of sync with my motions and whatever. I see that on the screen here. I'm not sure if you're seeing that or not. Um, I mean, it's because of the software that I'm using to have this like neat little window up in the corner and all of that. Uh, I think I need more processor power to actually run this. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to try to remember to write bigger in case people are having that problem. Um, oops. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about any administrative issues or anything before I start? Okay, so in that case, I'm just going to um, remind you of the uh, what I said were the four different issues that Carnap is trying to resolve all in one using construction theory. So, um, and, uh, rather than write them all out in long sentences like I did before, I'm just going to call them first one is an issue of logic or set theory. Second one is an issue of an ontology. The third one is about language. And the fourth one is about epistemology. Right, so uh, the, that is the first one is that problem I was talking about before, and I'm going to talk about it again somewhat today about the paradoxes of naive set theory. Um, and construction theory uh, is supposed to, well, it's supposed to have already solved that basically, and to be the only way of solving that. Oh, someone said I don't see the recording icon. Huh. Okay. Do you see the recording icon now? Okay. I also, I have two ways of making a recording that I do at the same time, so I can use the other one if I forget to do this one, but thank you for reminding me that, because the other one might fail too. <laughs> um, right, anyway, so that, uh, so that, in case I decide to use this recording that just started now, these are the four issues that Carnap is trying to solve using construction theory. Um, the first one is an issue about logic or set theory. Um, Russell's theory of types, which is basically what construction theory, construction theory is Russell's theories of types applied to uh, more objects. That's, Carnap believes that that's the only solution to the paradoxes of set theory. 
The second issue is this ontological issue about um, the existence of objects with different modes of being, um, trying to understand what that means, uh, um, um, in trying to, in some way, justify that, to say, yes, it's true that there are, there are objects that are so different from each other that they don't even exist in the same sense. And yet, at the same time, trying to defend the thesis that there's really only one kind of object. Um, and so, uh, going along with that, trying to defend the thesis that there are many sciences that are fundamentally different from each other, and at the same time defend the thesis that there's one unified science, that it all fits together into one science. So that was the second thing that construction theory is supposed to do. The third theory, the issue about, the third issue, the issue about language was the issue, as I put it, about how can we tell in advance which statements are meaningful. So construction theory is going to answer that by saying that any statements uh, that are um, um, reducible to a certain kind of basis in construction theory are meaningful, and the ones that aren't are nonsense. And then the fourth issue about epistemology, how does, how does science have a right to make statements about things that can't be directly observed? Um, is, construction theory is supposed to answer that by, sh by showing that every scientific statement can be reduced to, can be transformed into a statement about things that are directly observed. Um, so last time, um, I spent a while talking about number one on the list. <laughs> I'm not sure how, yeah, I can't decide whether this is better or the other way is better. It's me standing up. Anyway, be that as it may. So um, I'm going to talk about that some, actually some more now. Um, but uh, I'm going to try to get back, I hope fairly quickly, to relating it to the others and especially to this one because this is the one that most clearly shows how this is philosophy of science, what this has to do with science. Um, okay, so, um, but like I said, I'm going to start by saying a little bit more about this one. Um, because there was, there was more about it in the reading for today, that, and I want to explain what's going on. Um, so, um, what is a set or a class? Carnap actually distinguishes between sets and classes, right? He says that sets are mathematical objects, whereas classes are a feature of logic. Um, I think I understand what distinction he's making. I'm not sure if it's important. It's anyway. Uh, uh, in this book, he talks about classes, not about sets. Um, so, um, you, you can think of a class as a bunch of stuff that all fits a certain description. Now, um, the class might, if it has a finite number, number of members, the description might just be a list. Right, so the, if the if the members of the class are like this marker and this pen and my nose, 
then um, then the description that the members of the class fits is going to be is that marker or that pen or Abe's nose, <laughs> right? But of course, in the case of infinite sets, that's not possible to literally list them all. And so we have to have a general type of description. Um, so the description is going to be something um, And I'm going to use the symbol uppercase V to stand for it. The description is going to be something that you could say about something. <laughs> so you can say it about, let's say, X. So like, you know, an example of description is, um, um, has no factors but x and 1. This is some, phi x might mean that, right? So phi x means x has no factors but x and 1. So like phi 2 means 2 has no factors but 2 and 1. That's true, right? 2 is prime. Phi 4 means 4 has no factors but 4 and 1. That's false. 4 also has 2 as a factor, right? So 4 is not prime. Um, but uh, so this propositional function, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this description like eats an object and spits out a truth value, true or false. So you can think of, also you can think of this description as a function from objects to truth values. Um, so uh, Kayak will call something like this a propositional function. Um, actually, I guess he thinks not of truth values as a value, but statements. It gives you a statement, which then is true or false. So I guess I'm confusing Carnap with Frege. Right, so he thinks the function takes an object, like 2 or 4, and returns a statement, like 4 has no factors but 4 in itself, or 2 has no factors but 2 in itself. So that's why he calls it a propositional function. It's a function from objects to propositions or statements. Is class another word for domain, someone asked. Um, no, in general, class is not, a, not another name for domain, although sometimes Carnap might use domain or a word that's translated as domain as synonymous with it, but... Uh, um, I mean, he uses domain in a couple of ways. Once, sometimes he talks about object domains. I think these are different German words. I should check. But anyway, sometimes he talks about object domains, like the domain of physical things or something like that. But the technical use of domain comes in the case of relations, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So let me just finish talking about classes, and then I'll talk about relations, and, and maybe then I'll say what domain is. Um, so um, um, right. So this is a propositional function. So this is a description that. Um, it's a general description that individual things can, uh, that can be applied to individual things. And a class, then, is like everything, in, in some sense of, of this, the class is everything 
that meets that description. And we can write it in Carnap's notation like this. This is the class of everything that is phi. Right, so this x with a hat out in front is to tell you which thing in here is the variable that we're going to apply the description to. Um, so x hat phi x is supposed to mean the class of everything that's phi. So for well, actually, uh, no. Yeah, it's no, it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. So the class of everything that's phi, so for example, if phi x means has no factors but x in itself, or sorry, x and one, then this class um, is the class of prime numbers, right? It's the class of everything that has no factors but itself and one. That's the class of prime numbers. Um, and, um, then there's one other symbol I want to introduce, which is uh, sometimes called set epsilon, set membership symbol. Right? So that means Y is a member of the class of everything that is phi. Right? Like, so for example, if phi was this, we can write down, um, uh, so let P be well, I'm forgetting I promised to write bigger. Let P be the class of everything that has no factors but itself and one. So then we, um, we can write something like 2 is a member of P, meaning 2 is one of these things. This is true. Or 4 is a member of P. This is false. Now, I mean, that what I've said so far is basically just notation. Um, um, I guess, well, I guess, and I should say one more thing about it. So, uh, of course, if this is true, if Y is a member of the class of all things that are P, then That must be a true statement, and vice versa, right? So y is going to be a member of the class of all things that are phi if and only if y is phi. All right. So I mean, so 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 that's like explaining the notation and what things are supposed to be true about classes. Um, are there questions about this so far? Um, um, I guess before I say the next thing, I should say one more important thing about classes as Carnap understands them. So, um, uh, 
um, suppose you have two propositional functions. Suppose you have these two propositional functions and so you have, you can write down these, those are two names of classes. But suppose it's the case that, um, for all y, y is a member of this, if and only if, I didn't leave enough space. Y is a member of that, right? That is, su suppose that exactly the same things are phi that are psi. Now this can be the true even though phi and psi are different, dis different descriptions, right? Like, it, you know, it could be, um, um, Uh, you know, like uh, nurses, it's young and has hair. <laughs> um, so those those are two different descriptions, but the same types of animals meet both of those descriptions, namely mammals. Uh, let's say that's true. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not. Maybe some mammals don't have hair or something. But suppose that's true, <laughs> right? So, um, so those are two different descriptions, but they're met by exactly the same things. And in that case, we say that these are the same class. Right? So, um, so classes are individuated, as we say, not by the descriptions that you can use to um, uh, to get names of them, but by the extensions of those descriptions, by what things the descriptions actually apply to. All right. Um, so again, are there questions about this before we go on? Um, all right, so um, now the important thing uh, from Karnas' point of view to notice about this right away is the distinction between a class and a whole. Um, right, like I said, in some sense, the class is all the things that the description applies to. So if the description is like, is a brick in this wall here, then the class in some sense is all the things that are bricks in that wall. Um, so you might think the class is the wall. I mean, suppose the wall is completely made out of bricks, right? It doesn't contain any, anything else. <laughs> so it's just all bricks. So you might think the class is all the bricks that are in that wall, and the wall also is all the bricks that are in that wall. So you might think the class of bricks in that wall is the same as the wall. Um, but uh, um, the way to see that that's not the case is to think about another class, like let's say the class of atoms in the wall. So the class of, um, so like if phi is is a brick in W, and C is is an atom in W, then this condition is not met, right? It's not true that everything that
that is a brick in the wall W is also an atom in the wall W, nor is it true that everything that's an atom in the wall W is also a brick in the wall W. On the contrary, bricks and atoms are completely different, right? No brick is an atom. Bricks are, are much bigger than atoms, for example, <laughs> right? So, um, so, um, These are two different classes, right? The class of bricks in the wall is not the same as the class of atoms in the wall. But um, they're the same whole, right? That is, in the sense that the wall is all the bricks in the wall, the wall is also all the atoms in the wall. So that's what shows that um, holes and classes are not the same. That is, that the whole made up out of the members of the class is not the same as the class. If you add all of the, the things that are members of the class together as parts to get a whole, you're, what you're getting is something different from the class. Okay, other questions about that? Um, Okay, and then uh, there's one other thing to add about this, which is about relations. So, um, um, this is not the way people usually think about relations now in set theory. And there's reasons for that, but I'm not gonna go into it. But the way, uh, Carnap following Frege and Russell thinks about relations. See, that's what's wrong with this new setup. When I turn around like this, unless I do this, <laughs> you're only seeing my torso. I don't know. All right, anyway, this has to be the butt. But um, the way Carnap uh, thinks about relations is that a relation is kind of like a set, but it's built on a different type of propositional function. So here's a propositional function where you have to supply two different things to get the proposition. So for example, uh, R, X, Y might mean uh, X is greater than Y. Right, so if you fill in only x, you get something like, like let's say you fill in two for x, then you get two is greater than y. You don't yet have a proposition that could be either true or false. Or you could fill in one for y, and then you would get something like x is greater than one. Again, you don't yet have a proposition or statement that could be either true or false. To get a statement, you have to fill in both. And it matters which order you fill them in, right? That's why I, you have to use two different variables here. Um, because two is greater than one is not the same statement as one is greater than two. On the contrary, two is greater than one is true, but one is greater than two is not true, right? So some relations are symmetric, meaning that you can switch the order and preserve the truth value. But, uh, but uh, lots of important relations are not symmetric, like the greater than relation. So the order always matters. So, um, um, so Carnap will write the relation this way, just like a set, only with two variables out instead of one. So, um, or sorry, just like a class only with two variables instead of one. And um, you can think of that, this as having, um, um, something that's just like a class, only it's more complicated. It has this two part structure to it. And that's the way Carnap thinks about relations. 
right? I mean, you could also not think about this as a relation, but just think of it as another kind of class where um, we're talking about a property of ordered pairs of objects, right? So you, that is, you can get rid of all these relations and make everything into classes by making the object the description applies to the uh, itself an ordered pair, right? So in other words, you can think of greater than as uh, a description that when you plug in two comma one, it gives you a true statement and you plug in one comma two, it gives you a false statement. This is the way people usually think of relations now, right? So that is, um, if you've been introduced to this at all, you've probably been told a relation is a set of ordered pairs. Oh, someone just asked, so a class implies set members plus the particular relationship they share? I think... Um, I think the person asking this question might that you might be a little bit confused about the terminology. Um, so again, a class is all the things that share a certain description, but the certain description is true of all of them, right? Like all the primes are there; those are all the things that have only themselves and one as a factor. A relation is something that um, um, a description, so to speak, that holds between pairs of things. So it describes a certain relationship things could have to other things. Um, and uh, so it's it's like a class, but it's in that it's all the things that something is true of, only it's more complicated because this kind of description is true of something only relative to something else. You have to fill in both. Those few people I can see are not looking happy. <laughs> Is, again, think of the example, right? Like the the relation greater than Carnap is thinking of as sort of all the things that are greater than something. So it's like every something that's greater than something. And you have to fill in both to get an example. So again, you can think of it this way. You can say, well, look, I'm just talking about pairs of things, ordered pairs of things, right? So I'm saying like greater than is true of this ordered pair of things because two is greater than one. Greater than is false of this ordered pair of things because one is, greater than, is not greater than two. Um, but Carnap isn't introducing these ordered pair objects to explain what a relation is. He's just saying a relation is to a two-place propositional function what a class is to a one-place propositional function. It's, I say, is it important that you understand this or not? Okay, so uh, there's two questions here. One is, is the relationship, you, you should say relation, not relationship, I think, in this context. Is the relation the set of ordered pairs which satisfy R, or is it R itself? Well, R itself is a propositional function, 
right? Or it's actually a piece of a propositional function, right? So it's like, it's kind of like the symbol greater than without filling in that it needs two things to be between X and Y. So, um, you know, X is greater than Y as Carnap understands it as a propositional function with, of, with two variables, a propositional function of two variables, right? That is given an object and another object, it gives you a statement or proposition that can be either true or false. So, you know, I take the function, the propositional function, x is greater than y, and I supply a value for x and a value for y, and it gives me a statement. So I supply 2 and 1, and it gives me the statement 2 is greater than 1. I supply 1 and 2, and it gives me 1 is greater than 2. I supply 17 and 3, and it gives me 17 is greater than 3. Right? So, um... So like, that's an example of what I'm using R to stand for, that type of description, greater than as an example. Um, uh, so you can think of the, what I'm saying is you can think of the relation itself as a set or class of ordered pairs. And in that case, relations are just a kind of class, right? That is, you just end up with classes and not something else that's called relations. And again, that's the way people usually do it in set theory now. They introduced one thing that's called a set, and then they introduce relations by saying, well, some sets are sets of ordered pairs, and those we call relations. If every member of the set is an ordered pair, then you have a relation. But again, that's not the way Carnap is thinking of it, and it's not the way Frege or Russell think of it they think of a relation as like a generalized, a generalization of the notion of a class where a, a class is all the things that meet, that, that, um, um, all the things that yield true statements when you apply a certain one place description to them. So the class of prime numbers is all the things that give you a true statement when you apply to them the description has as factors only one in itself. Then they say, but you can generalize that because there's descriptions that have more than one place that you have to fill in. Like X is greater than Y. So you can form something that's like a class but it's more complicated because the description that it's based on is more complicated. Um, it doesn't make any math, math well, it doesn't. If you do things right, that you could make these two ways of looking at it mathematically equivalent. It's not, it doesn't change like what the properties of relations are. But it's a different way of thinking about it. So from a philosophical point of view, it can make a difference. Whether you think of, of relations as a type of class or as something that's like a class but more complicated. Um, if you still don't understand, it's probably not that important. It's not like this is going to come up a lot in the rest of the course. Uh, so, But let me see. There's one more question here. Just to make sure, a class would be that X, Y, and Z are under class of letters. Well, they're using X, Y, and Z not as variables, but as names of objects, right? <laughs> um, so that, that's a little bit confusing. X, Y, and Z are letters. But, but anyway, so substitute some other class. You know, a class would be like uh, salmon pike and uh, catfish are types of, are, are under the class of fish, are under the class of species of fish, I guess you would say, right? Those are members of the class species of fish. Because there's a description, is a species of fish that all of those things, right? There's a, a propositional function, X is a species of fish. But if you plug in salmon, you get a true statement. Salmon is a species of fish. If you plug in pike, you get a true statement. Pike is a species of fish. Whereas on the other hand, if you plug in bear, you get a false statement. Bear is a species of fish. 
Um, okay, so that's a class. A relation is a description between the two. Between the two, does not necessarily mean similarity. Like x is greater than y and y equals z. Right. So the relation is so. I mean, so. The proposition, what corresponds to the propositional function, like the propositional function x is a species of fish, is going to be a propositional function with two places. And you can think of it as kind of, and that's what's behind this notation of putting x and y on the opposite sides of r, the way Carnap does. Nowadays, by the way, people are more likely to write it this way, with x and y on the same side. But... But Carnap, is, you can think of this description as kind of like getting you from X to Y, showing you how X relates itself to Y or something like that. Again, like mathematically speaking, it doesn't matter if you write X and Y on opposite sides or on the same side, obviously. It's going to be the exact same theory. But philosophically speaking, it may make a difference how you think about it. Um, so, but anyway... Yeah, so that's the propositional function, right? That corresponds to a propositional function like this. It's just like it, only it has two places instead of one. What corresponds to the class, this is what kind of calls the relation, actually. Right, the relation is... So in the case of species of fish, we have the class of all species of fish, right? In the usual set theoretic notation, we would write it with angle brackets like this. Salmon, pike, etc. right? And since there's a finite number of species of fish, we could just list them all. Um, but... Uh, so anyway, right, that's the class. On the relation side, we have the same thing, only for a propositional function that has two places. So, um, um, you could, you could, you could have a notation like this only for re relations, except it would have to be um, um, two-dimensional or at least have two columns or something like that so that you could, you know, um, In the case of a finite relation where you could list all the things that the relation holds between, you know, so maybe you could write it like, um, something like that, right? Like two, and then you list all the things that are less than two, three, and then you list all the things that are less than three, and then dot, dot, dot. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine how you would do that there. That's not a standard notation that I just wrote up there. Um, does that make it a little clearer what it is? Okay. So, um, all right, so that's class and relation theory. And by the way, so I'm, t I'm talking about a relation with two places, but you could have more than two places. You can have as many places as you want, and all the others are just called relations, right? So there's two-place relations, three-place relations, right? So like an example of a three-place relation would be x plus y equals z. I mean, well, sorry, a three-place propositional function might be x plus y equals z. Right, it has three places that you have to fill in. If you fill them all in, you get a statement that's either true or false. So, you know, if you fill in 
1 for x and 2 for y and 3 for z, you get 1 plus 2 equals 3, which is true. But on the other hand, if you fill them in a different way, you get something false. And you can have as many places as you want. And, you know, the more places you get, the more complicated this structure is going to be. Um, but, uh, um, uh, but in principle, all the same things apply. Carnap doesn't talk about three place relations or higher very often. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure how he, then you can't put the R between, you have to put two of them on the same side for three. I don't, I don't remember how he does it. Um, okay, so that's that's the theory of classes and these relations that are kind of like classes or a generalization of classes and then the problem with it is okay so let's let our propositional function be um, this is a propositional function right this this here let me write it bigger Right? This says X is not a member of X. So, um, on the face of it, it seems that some classes are members of themselves and some are not. So, like, for example, uh, the class of everything Carnap is interested in That's a bad example. The class of every the example I was going to give. Let me write it down. The class of everything I've talked about in lecture today. How about that? <laughs> right? So that's a description. Something Abe has talked about in lecture today. One of the things I've talked about in lecture today is that very class. So the description apparently applies to the class itself. Whereas other classes seem not to be members of themselves, right? So like the class of all pens on this table, um, uh, so the, the propositional function that X is a, is, a, is a pen on this table, when you plug in the class of all pens in this table, you get the class of all pens on this table is a pen on this table, that sounds false, right? The class of all pens on this table is not a pen. It's a class, <laughs> right? So it seems like we can divide all classes into classes that are members of themselves and classes that are not members of themselves. And here, we're just focusing on the ones that are not members of themselves. And then we, so this is a propositional function. It gives true or false depending on what class you plug in. So, um, um, again, if you plug in the class of everything Abe has talked about in lecture today, you would get uh, um, a false statement, right? It would, it would say, in effect, Abe has not talked today about the class of all things that he's, meant, that he's talked about today, but I have, right? So that would be false. But then if you plug in the class of pens on this table, you would get the class of pens on this table is not a pen on this table, and that's true, right? So then we say, okay, let's form the class corresponding to this propositional function. This is called the Russell class. I'm going to write it as R, the Russell class. And then we ask, okay, is R a member of itself? And you can probably see right away that this is going to lead to trouble, but if you can't, let me just spell it out for you. Suppose L is, R is a member of itself. Then this description doesn't apply to it, right? Because this description says it's not, something is not a member of itself. So if R is a member of itself, then this description doesn't apply to it. And if this description doesn't apply to it, then it's not a member of R. So if R is a member of itself, then it's not a member of itself. 
Okay, so I guess um, it can't be that R is a member of itself, so we must say R is not a member of itself. But if R is a member of itself, then R is a member of itself. Then R is uh, not a member of itself, right? Because everything that's in R is not a member of itself. <laughs> so from R is a member of itself, we can get R is not a member of itself. And from R is not a member of itself, we can get R is a member of itself. And this means that no matter what we say, we get a contradiction. Right? So that is, this shows that naive set theory that allows me to use any description here and apply it to anything I want and test to see whether it meets the description is self-contradictory. Which, as Carnap says, is the worst of all things that could happen to a philosophical theory. Right. Now, I'm already, boy, I'm spending much longer on this than I wanted to. Okay, I'm going to try to get quickly through the rest of this. So how do you solve this? Well, as I said last time, what you want to do is, uh, at least to head off this particular paradox, you want to make sure that, um, that a statement of that form is, uh, you're not allowed to write it. It couldn't be either true or false. It's nonsense. Oh, could I? Someone asked if I can re-explain the paradox. Yeah, let me try to re-explain it one more time. Well, maybe I shouldn't. The thing is, I mean. It is worth knowing what this paradox is and how it came up. Uh, it's uh, not going to be the topic of the rest of this course, however, right? We just All you have to know to understand what comes next is that somehow we got a paradox out of writing things like this. But if you're allowed to write things like this, and, and therefore things like that, that you end up contradicting yourself. And in order to prevent that, Russell's solution is to make sure that these statements are um, uh, that they're ruled out by the rules of the language of set theory, right? So that they're not again, they're not false. They're they're nonsense, right? That is, he wants to put them in the same category as something like. Uh, Right, where we took some, we take some symbols that are used in set theory and just put them in an order that doesn't make sense. Russell wants to make these be in that same um, uh, category of strings of symbols that you're not allowed to put together in that order. Right, so that way that means you can't even say this. So in other words, the, the way we're avoiding the paradox is by saying that this is not a propositional function. This is not a description that something can fall under. I haven't described anything. I've written some symbols in an order that I'm not allowed to write them in. So I think, like, if you want to understand, if, if my explanation of where we get the paradox didn't make sense, you know, you can Google Russell's paradox and you'll probably find a better explanation than I gave in Wikipedia or something. But to understand where I'm going on from here, all you have to know is Russell wants to make sure you can't say this. And the way he makes sure you can't say it is what's called the theory of types. Um, and um, Carnap states the basic idea of this.
This is on page 64, section 37. Nothing can be asserted of a class that can be asserted of its elements, and nothing can be asserted of a relation extension that can be asserted of its members. Right, so what that means is, let's turn back to here. Um, since if A is a member of A, then we can assert this of, if I, sorry, if small A is, man, let me not. If B is a member of A, then is a member of A is something we can assert about B, that is, about one of the elements of A. Therefore, according to that principle I just quoted, we can't assert this same thing of A itself. Right? Remember, nothing can be asserted of a class that can be asserted of the members of that class. Um, or, in other words, the propositional function you're not allowed to plug just any, well, okay, sorry. You're not allowed to plug just anything in as the value of x in that propositional function. And in particular, if you're allowed to plug in something that's a member of A as the value of x, then you're never allowed to plug in A as a value of X. So like going back to the question, like is the set of pens on this table a pen? Before we said, that sounds false. It's not a pen, it's a class. But now we're going to say that question is nonsense. Right? Because what you are asking is whether... Um, the class of pens of this table can be plugged, it gives a true statement when you plug it into the propositional function, is a pen on this table? And the answer is you're not allowed to plug it into that propositional function. That argument only takes physical things. It doesn't take classes of physical things. It, that is, because that argument of the propositional function accepts physical things as its value, it doesn't accept classes of physical things as its value. So by doing that, you end up with a hierarchy of sets, right? That is, and I, I mentioned this last time, but I'm just gonna say again how this works out, right? That is, if you start with individuals, things that are not classes, like pens or whatever, then you can form classes of them. Um, now, so the classes of individuals uh, can't be members of other classes of individuals, but you can say things about them. Right? Like, uh, you can say the class of pens on this table has more members than the class of books on this table. That's a, a description. You can change it into a propositional function. X has more members than Y. In that case, it's a relation. So let me say X has, uh, you can say the, the set of pens on this table has three members. That's a description of a class. Um, you can change it into a propositional function. X has three members. And um, from that propositional function, you can form a class, the class of things that have three members. But the class of things that have three numbers can't be, it's not a class of individuals. 
So we introduce another level. Classes of classes of individuals. And so, you know, in this level, it's going to be the class of pens on this table. In this level, it's going to be the class of all classes of individuals that have three members. And then you can see how that would keep repeating. Um, um, so that's the theory of types, right? These are called types. This is the lowest type, and then there's another type above that, and then there's another type above that. If you put in relations, the hierarchy becomes much more complicated, right? Because um, you, there can be a relation that take that you know it has one type for its first um, argument place, but has a different type for the other one. Right, so you, you get much more, a lot more different possible things, but this is the basic principle of it. And if you just keep this in mind and never form a class of, um, on a certain level of things on that same level, you avoid the paradox, right? Because then, you know, you can't form the Russell class the class of all classes that are not members of themselves is not a class. And it's not a class because the dis it, because X is not a member of itself is not a good description. It's not, sorry, it's not a propositional function. Because, so, because it's nonsense. That's the way the theory of types is supposed to avoid the paradox. Now, the question is, however, how to justify that? I mean, like, you just tell me you can't say these things. So if I don't say them, right, it's kind of like the old joke about, like, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, okay, don't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I want to know what's wrong, right? I don't want to know why it hurts when I do this. <laughs> That's, the, you know, so you say, well, doctor, I get a paradox when I make, uh, you know, classes be members of themselves. And the doctor says, okay, don't make classes members of themselves. And I want to say, well, uh, no, I mean, why can't I make me classes member of themselves? I want to know what the mistake was. So, um, there are different ways of understanding this, but the way um, Carnap in this book understands it is related to what Russell calls the no class theory. <laughs> and the no class theory says that all this talk about classes is just shorthand for talking about their members. So how does that work? Well, you know, suppose I have two classes. S is the extension of phi. That's how you can read this, these symbols. That is, S is the class of everything that meets description phi. And T is the extension of C. Um, and then I can say certain things about S and T. For example, I might want to say S is a subclass of T. So it looks like um, uh, I'm talking about S and T, right? There are, I'm assuming that there are such things as S and T. How can you say, how do you get a no class theory, meaning I can get rid of S and T in terms of, and in favor of only talking about their members? Well, that, so the answer has two steps. First of all, we replace everything else we say about the classes with, um, we, we, we get to a form where the only, 
where everywhere the name of a class occurs, it occurs in a statement like that. Oops, that's off the top. Right, and Carnap doesn't show this, but he mentions in passing somewhere, you can always do this, right? That is whatever you said about these classes, you can always get rid of all the symbols except set epsilon. And, or I mean, that is, you can always get to a statement where every place there's a name of a class, it occurs in a context like this. So for example, in the case of S is a subclass of T, um, this is pretty simple. Right, we, we replace this statement that has the subclass symbol in it with this statement where S only occurs here and T only occurs here, right? And it says for all X, if X is a member of S, then X is a member of T. That's what we mean by S is a subclass of T. So again, the claim is everything we want to say about sets can be, you can transform it this way. That's step one. This still seems to say there's such thing as it sets S and T, right? Something is a member of them. But then we can replace every place where... Oops, I probably can't see that. We can replace every statement like this with... Well, actually, let me not use X for it. Let me use Y. All right. So we can replace everything like this. Y is a member of the extension of T with something like this. Y is T. <laughs> right? That is, to say this whole thing, Y is a member of the class of things that are phi, is just the same as saying that Y is phi. So the idea behind the no class theory is that sometimes it's convenient to use these symbols that are names of something called classes, but that if you want to, you can always get rid of them all and only talk about their members. Um, And if this is really true of classes, if classes, if, if the only reason for introducing these symbols that are names of something called classes is because, um, is as a shorthand for complicated expressions that, that only talk about the members of classes, um, then you can understand why, um, it's just a mistake to think that you could write something like this. Right, because when you try to do the transformation and get rid of the S symbol, in this case, you end up with um, You end up with um, um, I thought I could make this clear. Right, sorry. So, I mean, now when you do the transformation, it doesn't work. You don't end up with an expression that's just about the members of classes. 
And if it's true that the names of classes were only introduced in the first place as a shorthand or a different way, a more convenient way of talking about their members, then it couldn't have ever been the intention when it was introduced to allow you to write something like that. Right? Because this can't be understood as a shorthand for talking about the members of S. Because when, again, because when you do this, you don't get rid of the name of the class. I guess, I mean, actually, they need to just better write it this way. It's still there. <laughs> right? So, so, so the claim is that people start saying something like this when they forget that the class names are just a, a sh convenient shorthand for talking about their members. And that's the justification for saying why you shouldn't say it, right? It's not just I'm telling you not to say it because if you do, you'll get to a paradox. Um, it's I'm telling you what mistake you you made that got you involved in that paradox. The mistake was you thought that these things actually name objects, just like the, you know, if I, if this pen's name is Fred, um, Fred is the name of an object, this pen. So I also thought if I, if S is the set of pens on this, or the class of pens on this table, that similarly, uh, S is the name of some object, namely the class of pens on this table. But that was just a mistake. Actually, S is just a way of talking about the pens on this table to make it convenient to talk about them. Um, but after I made that mistake, this again is how Russell and Carnap are thinking, since I made that mistake, then I start trying to plug in S in, the, in all the places I could plug in Fred. Um, and that's how eventually I end up with a paradox. Um, okay. Um, so the details of the paradox weren't important, but the details of how Carnap and Russell think the paradox gets solved are important. Why is it saying my battery? Oh, I see. Um, right, because, uh, um, so as Carnap understands it, the solution was that, um, Um, the reason we got in the paradox is into the paradox is we didn't realize that things on the lowest level uh, exist in a totally different sense than things on the other levels. And what is the totally different sense? Well, the things on the lowest level are objects, but the things on the higher levels are what Carnap calls quasi objects. That is, we, we have names for them as if they were objects, but, um, but they're names that could really be eliminated in, ter in, in favor of only talking about the things on the lowest level again. So the no class theory and the fact that, um, so the fact that the theory of types seems to be necessary to avoid the paradox and the no class theory seems to be the justification of the theory of types seems to show that you must think about objects as divided into a hierarchy like that of the real objects at the bottom and the quasi objects above them. Right? That is, you're logically required to think of it that way. Otherwise, you'll contradict yourself. Now, Again, I hoped to, to do this part quickly and then get to the other part, but I see that, of course, that doesn't, hasn't exactly happened. Um, but still, before I go on to anything else, I want to ask if there are more questions.
Okay, well, um, so how kind of uses this in construction theory? Um, so one way of using this, and I think Russell basically does contemplate using it this way, is to draw a metaphysical moral thing. There's some kind of objects that really exist. Those are the actual objects. Everything else is a quasi-object. So it doesn't really exist. It's just an um, artifact of our language that we seem to be talking about something with. Um, so, for example, if what you put on the lowest level, what Carnap calls the basis of the constructional thing system, was things like hens, physical things, or actually in German he just calls them things, Dinge. Um, that's weird. This is a purple marker, but it looks blue. Anyway, um, um, then you would be saying, well, what they really are in the world are bodies, objects like pens. In a sense, I mean, I think Carnap, when he's being careful, actually would classify a pen as a cultural object because to be a pen, it has to be used in a certain way. In a, in a practice that human beings have, whatever, something like that. But forget about that, or, or use another example like stones or something, right? So, like, what would be the real objects would all be material things, and everything else is, um, doesn't really exist. It's just a way we have of talking about material things. So that kind of constructional system, if that were the right one, so to speak, what it would mean is that we should be materialists. We should only believe in the existence of material things. And on the other hand, a constructional system like the one that Carnap is going to set up in the Alpha, where the lowest level consists of what are called my experiences. Whose experiences? Well, I guess in this way of going on thinking about it, I would say, well, mine. That is, if I'm reading it, I would say they're mine. If you're reading it, you would say they're yours. But anyway, so I would be reading it and thinking, okay, so what really exists are my experiences. And everything else doesn't really exist. It's just a convenient way of talking about my experiences. So that would be a form of solipsism. Right? That the only thing that exists is me. My mind is the only thing that exists. And as metaphysical theses, those are inconsistent with each other, right? We would have to decide which, which is the real basis. Is it material things or is it my experiences or is it your experiences <laughs> or is it everyone's experiences put together, right? That's what Carnap calls a psychological basis. Um, those would be three different, right? That would be a form of idealism, I guess, but not solipsistic idealism. Like It would be like Barclayan idealism. Um, so understood as, metaphysical as a metaphysical thesis, this distinction between objects and quasi-objects would lead to a debate between different metaphysical schools. And that's exactly what Carnap wants to avoid. <laughs> Right, because remember, like, um, um, he wants to get rid of statements that are not empirically meaningful. Well, you know, like, by what empirical means could I test whether my experiences are what really exist or pens and tables are what really exist? My experiences would be the same either way. 
<laughs> of course, in one way, my experiences are just a w my talking about my experiences just a way about talking about tables and pens. And on the other way, tables and pens are just a way of talking about my experiences. But in terms of like what observations I will make, it's the same either way. There's no empirical difference. So Carnap doesn't want to understand it that way. And that's why he devotes this whole system, this whole section of the book to, to explaining all the different kinds of constructional systems we could have. We could have one with a physical basis. We could have one with an auto-psychological basis. Auto-psychological means it's just my experiences. We could have one with a, psycholog a broader psychological basis. It's everyone's experiences. He says he's not sure we could have one with a cultural basis. Maybe we could. <laughs> but, right, so there's at least three different possibilities. Um, broad possibilities. Within those, there's sub-possibilities. He doesn't really get into, but there are sub-possibilities, right? What are physical things? Are they things like tables and chairs? Or are they things like particles and fields, for example? Right? Those would be two different bases. Um, but in any case, um, Carnap says, which one is right? Depends what you're trying to do. <laughs> and this is actually, this is something that Carnap is going to stick with no matter how things change later on. He's going to always come back to this, that... Um, we set up certain languages in certain ways for a certain purpose. And the only question you can ask about which one is better is, um, which is better for my purposes? I mean, I think he furthermore believes that um, there's an absolute question about which is best for the purpose, right? Like, which is morally best? <laughs> but um, as time goes on, he says less and less about that because he begins to feel that talking about morality that way is itself a form of nonsense metaphysics and therefore is immoral. <laughs> right? So that morality requires irony requires not talking about morality. Once you start talking about it, as if good and evil were properties that certain things could have, in other words, the propositional function, X is good, and another one, X is evil, um, you're already talking about morality the wrong way. <laughs> That's what Carnap, in this book, he doesn't yet think that. But later on, he is going to think that, and therefore, he doesn't say anything about um, absolute purposes. Um, so, um, in any case, the choice that he makes in this book to use an auto-psychological basis so, right, so what that means is that the distinction between objects and quasi-objects is relative to choice of system, that is, relative to choice of how to talk about things. Which statements we want to eliminate in favor of which statements, basically. Do we want to end up with, a, with do we want a language where in the end we can translate everything into statements about physical things, or do we want a language where in the end we can translate everything into statements about my experiences? Um, in one of those languages, uh, um, physical things are objects and my experiences are quasi-objects. In the other language, my experiences are objects and physical things are quasi-objects. So the difference between objects and quasi-objects, the way Carnap thinks about it, as opposed to that metaphysical way of thinking about it that I mentioned earlier, which again may well be the way Russell thinks about it, but the way Carnap thinks about it, the distinction between objects and quasi-objects is relative to a choice of system form, or in other words, to a choice of language. 
Um, it's a very important question once you've chosen the system. Um, and also the question of, are, do these objects belong to the same type or object sphere, as he says? Right? The object spheres are just Russell's types applied outside of mathematics to ordinary objects. Do these objects belong to the same object sphere or not? Once you've chosen the system form, that's a very important question because if you get things mixed up that belong to different object spheres, you'll end up saying things that are nonsense. But it's a very important question once you've chosen, but the answer is relative to what one you chose. Because for example, if we chose that psychological basis, it's based on everyone's experiences, not just on mine. So in that system, my experiences and everyone else's experiences belong to the same type. They're all, they all belong to the fundamental type. It's at the basis of the system. Whereas in the auto-psychological auto system that Carnap has chosen, my experiences are the basic type, and other people's experiences, on the contrary, are a very high type, right? They're constructed First, I construct physical objects on the basis of my experiences, and then I construct other people's experiences on the basis of their, the behavior of their bodies, basically. Right? So what were members of the same type in one system are members of different types in another system. So that doesn't really have a metaphysical meaning either. So that that so he's he's giving an interpretation of that traditional ontological doctrine about different modes of being, but he's giving an interpretation of it that strips it of all actual metaphysical content because he thinks there is no metaphysical content. Metaphysics is nonsense, right? And replaces it with practical content, basically. Is it convenient to treat these as members of the same type or not? Well, it depends what they're trying to do. Okay, so um, what I should have spent most of the lecture talking about, and I think I'm going to have to talk about this next time, um, is, okay, so what is Carnap trying to do for which it's convenient to use the idle psychological basis? Right, like what's special about this basis? So for example, he says the physical basis is special and convenient because it's a basis in um, things that obey regular laws. Um, later on, he's going to say stronger things about why the physical basis is especially good. But at this stage, that's all he says about it. And when he says that, he's trying to Remember I said Neurath, um, who we're going to be reading some of his stuff later. Um, Neurath was a Marxist. Because he was a Marxist, he was a materialist. <laughs> right? Like Marxists have to be materialists. Um, they have to be dialectical materialists, whatever that means. Exactly. But anyway, they have to be materialists. So Neurat was a materialist, then he wanted Carnap to be a materialist. And the most Carnap would ever give him on that score was, well, a materialist language is convenient for many purposes. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what's going on there. But okay, but it's not convenient for the purposes of this book. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, what are the purposes of this book? Well, the purpose of this book is we want to solve not only those first three issues, which is everything I've been talking about so far, but the fourth issue, the epistemological issue. How does science get the right to talk about un unobservable things? And for that purpose, we need um, a system where Um, the reduction from one level to the lower level, the elimination of the names of classes and relations in favor of talking about their members goes from what's epistemically secondary to what's epistemically primary.
So, so this is not a, um, a feature of reduction in general, right? It is, it's not a function of the theory, it's not a feature of the theory of types or of construction theory in general, but it's a feature of the system in this book that things on a lower level are epistemically primary compared to things on a higher level. And the things on the lowest level have to be the things that are most epistemically primary, that are epistemically first. So what does epistemically primary mean? Um, Carnap says, this is the, the closest he comes to a definition. He says, you know, one type of thing is epistemically primary compared to another. If we know about that thing first, and then only on the basis of that know about the other one. So, like, the idea is, for example, that um, bodies are epistemically primary compared to psychological states, that is, so states of the soul, right? Um, bodies are epistemically primary compared to psychological states, because um, the way we know about psychological states is by observing the behavior of bodies. At least, I mean, so I guess I should say, compared to heteropsychological states, that is compared to the psychological states of other people. The way we know about their psychological states is by observing the behavior of their body. Um, or Carnap says maybe at some advanced stage of neuroscience, we would have another way of knowing about their psychological states by observing the behavior of their brain. Um, but even if that's possible, it's not necessary, right? Everything we know about psychological states now, Carnap says, we know without looking into people's brains, just by observing what they do, what they say, etc. So, um, so what's Right, so that says that bodies are epistemically primary with respect to psychological states. It doesn't say that bodies are realer than psychological states in some metaphysical sense. Again, Carnap wants to prevent you from saying that, <laughs> right? He wants to make sure that the constructional system won't include any statements like that at all. <laughs> um, but, okay, so um, that's how things are supposed to go, and that means that the lowest level has to be things that are absolutely epistemically primary, that is, things that we know before anything else, and on, their, on that basis, we know everything else. And that's what Carnap is going to call our fundamental experiences. That is, my fundamental experiences. Now my means whoever's using the language will use it to refer to their own, basically. Um, okay, so there's only one minute left, so I can't... Can I say something? Let me say this first, and then you can say something. <laughs> you, you, you can talk in the extra time. Um, yeah, so all I just want to say is, so how do we know what is epistemically primary? What are we talking about when we talk about that? Um, how do we know what we know on what basis and what is immediately available to our consciousness? Well, Carnap says, we ask science. So in other words, what, whatever's going on here, the relation to science is not going to be that um, philosophers know something in advance and tell science what to come up with. On the contrary, every stage in constructing this system, we're going to have, including the first stage, we're going to have to ask science for empirical findings to decide how to set up the system. But I'll talk more about that next time. Now, Margaret wants to say something. Um, you can drag the people's faces around so you don't need the Um, no, actually, it's different. I'm not just using Zoom. I'm using another, yeah, I can drag it around, but it's not. Sorry. Okay.
I thought it might. I thought she might say something funnier than that, <laughs> but she didn't oh, this also, time. Do they know you have rocks behind you? They don't know that I have a whole bunch of pet rocks behind me. Here is one. <laughs> okay, and on that Bye. note, <laughs> I'll see you next week.